Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. It's that time of the week to talk all things Tottenham Hotspur. I thought I'd get this video in specifically today because I understand I think it's going to be a pretty busy week ahead. Um, I think, I don't know if I said this in the last video, it was something I'd written, but I know we've had a few various things happen in recent days, but I was always told, well, I say always, I was told a few days back that this coming week was going to be the one where we're going to have a fair bit happening. So I thought I'll get this video in first. Otherwise, we'll end up having a week where I'll do a video and then loads of stuff happens that I haven't spoken about, whereas I can kind of properly then round it up next week. Um, you know what will happen now. I'll say this, and then as soon as this video gets launched into the world, loads of stuff will happen. But that's Tottenham Hotspur. That's what you've unfortunately got to kind of put up with. As a reporter, things can change or things can suddenly accelerate very, very quickly. Where should we start? It's going to very briefly touch on the Colchester friendly because obviously it's a few days ago now. So um, it's not, you know, it's not the biggest and most recent thing to probably talk about. But there are a few little things within it that I feel it's still quite interesting to have a very brief chat about. Uh, first off, just lovely to be at a match and a match with lots of fans, which was pretty cool as well um, to have, you know, noisy fans as well you know the um orient, uh, orient the colchester fans are banging their drum on one side a lot of spurs fans turned up as well and they were going through all the whole full repertoire of chants it was really really cool um and as, as the press seats are at colchester which is lovely people lovely stand horrific wi-fi and mobile internet connection but other than that it's a lovely kind of press area that's right within the fans as well so that was that was quite cool and obviously getting to see fans very excited about certain Tottenham stars turning up as well so if you missed it completely it was 3-0 to Spurs all of those goals pretty much kind of came in that first half quite quick fire a few of them as well um first goal very nice ball um I'm trying to think who it was I think it might have been Lucas put Bergwijn away down the left and then he uh played in uh, very unselfishly played in Son to fire home. Son hung Min back in Tottenham colours. Um, then it was a Son corner for Lucas to head home the second. And then the last one, um, the young right back, whose name I can never pronounce, and Rob Guest is always telling me how to pronounce it. I still can't. It's Pascotzi, I think it is. Um, played a nice little ball down the right. Son ran onto it, crossed it over, and Ali forced it in from close range. So... It was pretty much comprehensive performance. It was exactly the same as the Orient uh, game. You know, I've got to say exactly the same thing. Ultimately, still not about the result. It was more about getting fitness. But what I thought was pretty cool first off was seeing Sonny back. Sonny absolutely is just such a level above so many players. He's so, and it's no disservice to other players. It really isn't because he's that good. Um, and he just raised the game of Tottenham's play so much. You know, a goal, two assists. Um, only did the 45 minutes. He and Oliver Skip both did 45 minutes each. Uh, and then at half time, in the during the half time interval, they were kind of doing their warm down. We, we knew they were heading off. But obviously, that wasn't even the biggest thing this week for, for Son Hung Min. We also got his new contract. Yay! Finally announced. Um, it's one of those that, you know, you've heard me say it's it's been agreed. Let's Let's be honest. It's been agreed for a long time. And it was just a case of. Getting past that, remember, I'm not going to go into do too much detail, but you know I said before, the Bank of England loan had to be paid off. You couldn't use any of that money towards anything to do with player acquisition, acquisitions or keeping players, stuff like that. So they had to wait till that was paid off. And then obviously Sonny had to come back. You know, had to come back from um, his summer and get back in, get all the new kit, all of this sort of stuff. The new kit, uh, away kit was launched as well, which looks like someone's had a paintball fight in it. Um, and then once all that was done, finally they can announce something that we've kind of known has been coming for a long time. But that doesn't lessen the excitement of it, you know. Four-year deal um, as well, which is fantastic. And there was a really, really good... Well, two things were good. His interview was really good, essentially saying, you know, very much he could have just said, I love this club, I want to stay. But he didn't just say that. He said, look, I just want to, I want to win stuff. And I feel I can win that with Tottenham, which... Gives you a little insight, hopefully, into, you know, maybe an excitement among some of the squad of, of what 
they hope Paratici is going to do this summer and, and what kind of squad Nuno Espirito Santo is going to bring. You know, certainly know the players very positive about Nuno Espirito Santo as well so far. They've enjoyed working with him. He's very direct and honest. Um, was it Jaffet Tanganga told me he used the word transparent about him? And I understand that some of the players have been very clearly told they're either are or aren't in his plans. And I think that's probably the. I think players want to know that. I don't think players want to either just be hidden stuff hidden from them or, you know, or saying that they're in your team or just not talking to them at all. To just be straight and honest, especially this early in the summer or pre season, is a good thing. So. Yeah, that was great news for Sonny. Um, that interview was good, and there was also a really nice thing, if you haven't seen it, of him looking back over some of his kind of big goals and moments. Um, and he just, he's just such a lovely guy. You know, not to be around the bush, he's just such a lovely guy. Honestly, very fortunate to have interviewed him a few times. Um, and he, exactly as you imagine, he makes you smile. He's a very happy, smiling chap. And he makes everyone around him that little bit happier. And you can't say that about many people in the world. And I think that's a really, really cool thing. And that's not even taking into account the incredible talent he's got. For me, the next step for Sonny is to essentially do what he's been doing in recent seasons, but just consistently stretch it out across a whole season. And that's not his fault. He's overplayed. He's massively gets... Last season, he's, I think only Hoybier played more minutes than him as an outfield player. Um, and, you know, we're going to talk about a certain player a little bit later who I'm hoping will allow Sonny to get a little bit more of a rest at, at you know, moments we can so that he's there for all the big games and stuff. And I, I think probably Sonny is more arguably Spurs' most consistent big game player that they have. You know, maybe this is one thing that's said about Harry Kane, that sometimes he isn't really turning up in the biggest of games. Whereas I think Sonny on the... On the bulk, the majority of them does. And I think it's a big old signing, that, for Tottenham. You know, we've talked about transfers, but I think getting Sonny to commit, he's 29, a four-year deal as well. He could well see out his career at Tottenham. He really could. And I, and I think, you know, I love Sonny. There's no getting around it. I think he's absolutely phenomenal. Um, other little things quickly to take away from the Colchester game. Um, Oliver Skip mentioned him. He was superb. He was really good. Speaking to some people about him, and they, they feel that there's a real difference in him. He's come back from Norwich, where obviously a key integral part of their championship winning team. Um, and he's come back a much more confident guy. They wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say he was someone that really doubted himself before, but now he kind of is just a bit more sure of his status within the team and, and his value. Um, and yeah, and on the pitch and off of it, and on the pitch, he was, you know, I think maybe it's tough because I obviously got to see a lot of him in the academy, so I saw how a very confident Skip was who knew what he could bring to the party was on the pitch, whereas maybe Spurs fans who only watched the first team just got to see him tentatively starting to come into the first team and, and then understanding and reading the first team senior game. Whereas, obviously, he went away to Norwich and just played almost every minute. Uh, Daniel Farker worked really closely with him. And just to watch him, I know it was only a friendly, but just on the Wednesday night at Colchester, he was just dominating in the midfield. It absolutely had that Hoybier thing of just being able to anticipate. And and because Winks was playing in a, a much more deeper kind of anchor role, it allowed Skippy to get up the pitch and, and really get involved with play as well. And there was one moment where, you know, I've had people telling me that he doesn't have a great passing range and all this sort of stuff. And obviously, having seen a lot of him, I know he does. And it was just a lovely moment, I think, is a perfect highlight reel to show anyone that says he can't pass a ball um, or only passes sideways. He was running down the right and just mid-run, the ball bouncing up, he just hit this incredible half-volley crossfield right over to the left flank onto the chest of Steven Bergwijn, who was running down. And it was just... Perfect technique, perfectly executed, wonderful vision. You know, so if you think this guy is just a, a basic anchor man who will play sideways square passes, no, absolutely not. He's so much more than that. And personally, I've said it before, and you guys have heard me say it probably too many times, but I just think a, a double pivot with him and Hoybier in there, um, with the ability for either or to get forward, especially with Hoybier, what he did at the Euros, the way he got forward as well. It could be incredible. And, you know, and you stick a Lacelso and the melee just in front of that. Wow. Um, but, hey, I'm not the boss. 
We shall see what he does. But um, So Skippy was very good. Steven Bergwijn, I thought, showed lots of bright moments. He really worked very hard, um, as, as we kind of expect from him. What I'm told is that Steven Bergwijn and Deli Ali have both come back to pre-season in brilliant shape, like really, really top shape. And Nuno Spirit Santa has been really impressed with both. Um, Delhi on the pitch I felt it was another game where he maybe played in this kind of deeper role so he didn't really shine didn't get a chance to shine too much I'd still say he looks a little bit rusty I just don't think I think he's a guy who just hasn't played too much football over the last year or so I just don't think he's quite found his rhythm yet and I'm hoping that comes um, in a weird way I'd rather he's absolutely smashing it in training and finding slowly his rhythm in games rather than last summer where he was really shining in games and it was almost like a false dawn. It just suddenly went to pot in the first game of the season, you know, taken off at half time. Uh, Lucas was bright again. Uh, lovely header. It's just trademark Lucas header, isn't it? Leaping higher than anyone else um, and, and uh, flicking the ball on into the net. Um He's, you know, it's just when he gets on the ball, when he can run at people, he's very good at taking the ball from his own half and advancing up the pitch. And as I've always said about Lucas, the key for me then is what he does with the final ball. Um, he does have a habit of running past two or three people or, or two people and running into the third. And I think, you know, unless there's a huge bid comes in for him, which Spurs have had before, a very big bid, which they turned down from a couple of years ago, but... Unless that comes in, I think he'll be a part of Nuno Espirito Santo's squad. And I think he could be a very useful part of it as well. So I don't know entirely. I know he's got a, a lot of fans out there. I'm not entirely sure that I see him as a guaranteed first-team starter. But I think he could have a big part to play from the bench, maybe, maybe in the Premier League. Uh, but obviously getting starts here and there. But also they've got all these other cup matches really to think of as well. But I think as an overall squad player, I think he could be very helpful especially as it looks like we're going to lose Eric Lamella, who I'll come to a little bit later. Um, other one to mention, probably Dane Scarlett again. Um, Show some nice little touches. He, he came on at half-time. A very nice um, finish again, but unfortunately was ruled out for offside. He's uh, yeah, he's looking, looking very sharp, very, very good, which is um, it'd be interesting to see kind of whether these minutes continue and then, you know, that Europa Conference League, I think is going to be very, very important for him. I'm intrigued to see kind of where he goes from that. Um, the match itself kind of deteriorated slightly in the second half. It had very similar to what I said about the Orient match. There were seven players in this... Um, seven? Yeah, it was seven. Seven players came on in the second half and the game just goes on. It's going to go off the boil a bit after that. Um Alfie Whiteman, I think, was the only player who played the entire game. Pulled off some absolute cracking saves as well. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was actually his first senior start for Tottenham as well, Alfie Whiteman. And he was excellent. He was very, very good. Um, i trying to think. Probably the most interesting thing for me came off the pitch. And that was really watching closely Fabio Paratici. He was milling about before the match talking with uh, the technical performance uh, director, Steve Hitchin, and Dean Rastrick, the academy manager. Uh, he was occasionally talking, to, occasionally talking to Nuno Espirito Santo as well, but mainly the guy was just on his phone. Just like 95% of the time was on his phone. He had, uh, had his phone in his hand and he had kind of uh, earphones in. They weren't like AirPods or whatever. They were very much um, just wired up earphones, white earphones. And I think... Someone put it to me, which I don't know the ins and outs and logistics of it, but they said that technically AirPods maybe would be easier for someone to hack into. And I don't know whether that's actually a thing or not, um, but perhaps, you know, how paranoia it is, or maybe he just prefers wired earphones. I don't know, but he was on it a lot, and that was before the game. I'd imagine during the game I couldn't see him, but after the game he came back down to the pitch, was talking to Hitchin and Rastrick again, and Espirito Santo briefly, but mostly kind of strolling up and down the touchline almost um just yeah talking away on the phone and, and you know we'd imagine that's all transfer related probably i mean some people have been laughing it was you know ordering his uber eats or something or he was uh chatting with his mum or something but um 
Yeah, you'd imagine it was work-related as he was at work. But no, I thought that was, that was quite fascinating. Obviously, we've still got a few players yet to come back. Um, I was not trying to think who there wasn't. No Ryan Sessegnon again. No Sergio Reguilon. No Matt Doherty. Uh, Tongi Ondombele. Tongi Ondombele has just become a dad. Uh, so I'd imagine he's very much kind of wrapped up in all that that entails right now. Um, or certainly was. It's a difficult one. It's it's kind of a lot of people maybe making slightly, not too much, because I understand the curiosity, but a lot of people are, why isn't he there? Why isn't he in any of the photos? Why isn't he in this video? But what I would say is this is kind of a bit like a preseason, like no other in a way. I suppose maybe similar-ish to last year, but this one feels like a little bit longer of a preseason in that with everything that's going on in the world, we don't know, and I, and I must and I must stress, I don't know whether this is the case with any of any of these people or or, or you know any any staff or whatever. But you know, with what everyone's going through and so many people having to isolate, we have no idea whether some of these players, or staff, or younger players or anything, have maybe got someone in their family that's got COVID and, and they've had they've been in close contact, they've had to isolate, or maybe they've had COVID. COVID. It's like it's so difficult. It's not as cut and dried as it's been. You know, in the past, I could have just said, asked anyone, like, oh, you know, has blah, blah got an injury? And it's like, now clubs are just keeping everything under wraps more. And, and you know, and, and we're finding that it's not, it sounds weird to say, but it's not such a big deal if a player isn't playing or isn't in preseason stuff because we don't know what's kind of happening behind the scenes exactly right now with everything. And it's, and I must stress before, you know, sometimes I get these aggregated Twitter accounts that will go, Alistair Gould said this. And it's like, I must stress, I'm not saying that any of these players do or don't or anything uh, isolating, anything like that. I'm just saying we've got the potential for that to be coming into play with anyone in preseason. I know, you know, certainly new players coming in, like Galini, we're going to talk about, he's having to isolate at the training ground. Um, for five days so that he can just join in like Espirito Santo did as well and it's like it's a weird world we're living in it's a very different time and, and we can't just really look at everything with this very kind of black and white why isn't this happening oh has he fallen out with the manager or stuff like that it's so much more complicated now um, so yeah sorry that wasn't a rant I, had to, I hope that didn't come across as a rant it was just very much me saying it's not as cut and dried anymore um, <sighs> Harry Kane before I move on to transfers, we're going to move on to transfers a little bit quicker this time. But Harry Kane, obviously we have to talk about that front page story, um, which is stunned, wasn't it? Went out. Um, what to say? Um, I never want to ever be critical of other journalists' work ever because I know how, I don't want to say difficult this job is because, you know, there's people nurses working on the front line or miners working down underground and stuff. so I'm not ever going to say that this job is the most difficult job in the world but what I would say is it it can be complicated and it can be tough and you in terms of very much you're getting sources and you're talking to different people and different views and opinions and information and, and it's not always easy but the only thing I would say about obviously if you haven't read it if you missed it all it was essentially saying that it came from the wedding of uh, Charlie Kane, Harry Kane's brother, who's also his agent. And the story came out of that and essentially was just saying a deal was being agreed. Daniel Levy's made a big U-turn, um, £160 million fee and Harry Kane, four hundred grand a week, I think it was, contracts and all of that. And it just kind of, you know, obviously we have to, as journalists then, when something like that happens, we have to then dig around and ask ourselves and and. It was just the next morning. It was just like Spurs and Man City were both, huh? And, you know, it's it's very difficult to kind of... They just didn't seem to be kind of aware of any of that stuff. And, and Spurs very strongly maintained that he's they have no intention of selling him. No intention at all of selling um, Harry Kane this summer. You know, obviously, whether there is a late U-turn later in the in the window, I'd still be surprised because I think they'd look so daft. And from everything we're hearing from the Man City end as well, is saying that they've got no intention of paying the sort of money that uh, Spurs would want for Harry Kane. It's such a tough situation. I understand it's a tough situation for Harry Kane and his people and all of that because, 
ultimately, of all the summers, this is probably the one where it's the most difficult for it to happen. And it's probably the one where maybe is the most they've wanted it to happen in recent years. Um, but, yeah, I don't think the way these things are happening, I don't think the way these stories are coming out, I don't think it's... Whether it's intentional or not, I don't think it's doing Harry Kane any favours. If if his wish is to leave this summer, um, you know, as I've said before, I know he, he would be open to a new challenge. But whether there's an absolute hardline desire to leave this summer, it would it's making it very difficult because you know, rather than a U-turn, stuff like this is only making Daniel Levy and Spurs just dig their heels in even further. It's just. Yeah, it's it's I, if it's a tactic, I don't think it's the cleverest one. It, it may be that it's just unintentional and these leaks are occurring, but yeah, I don't think it's going to do that cause any favours whatsoever. Um, because yeah, Tottenham just don't want to sell and Man City aren't going to go up to the price that would even make them start to think about having chats. So uh, unless someone gets very, very desperate in all of this, and, and I can't see Harry Kane downing tools, he's just doesn't come across as that kind of guy and I don't think he'd want to do that to Tottenham or the fans um, but let's see, apologies if you can hear the rain it's absolutely hammering down um, which at least means the ice cream van is very unlikely to go by but uh, yeah, very unpleasant out there um, so let's talk about transfers, we have had our first one hurrah Pierluigi Gallini has arrived um, 26 year old goalkeeper from Atalanta, obviously I spoke about this last week that he was um, looking to be on his way. Oh, a bit of lightning there. Um, you may hear a big old roll of thunder as well. There you go. I don't know if you're going to hear that or not. But um, thunder and lightning, very frightening. But not uh, Galini because he sounds like... Um, he sounds like... It's a tough one to kind of sum up really because I've heard lots of very good things about him. I've heard some little things that he needs to work on. But what I thought was quite key about him was that he, in his first words, he very much was talking about it. he wants to be the future of Tottenham, but right now he really wants to learn everything he can from Hugo Lloris, which is perfect, which I think is exactly what Tottenham will want. Lloris, you know, he's got 12 months left on his deal. We'll have to see what happens with that. But I, I don't know. It's, you know, he's spoken before about going back to France in his later years. There's also been talk of maybe an MLS uh, move. Um... So I don't really know whether we're going to see him extend his stay or not. But he had his most consistent season last season. I'd probably say in a while. I thought he was very, very good. Um, so I think for anyone to learn from, I think he, he's he's perfect for him. And Galini, you know, he speaks good English. Obviously, he'd been at Villa and Man United before. Um, United in his younger years. Villa, kind of briefly. He was there for six months before he'd been loaned out. I think it was to Atalanta. Um uh, he obviously, unfortunately, isn't a homegrown player. He wasn't at United long enough for his 21st birthday, but it's a very clever deal. You know, I know the powers that be and Daniel Levy get a lot of flack at Tottenham, but the way that this deal's been structured, it's very clever. It's uh, pretty much Tottenham get him on loan for a year while he learns and studies and will probably, well, he will, uh, play in a hell of a lot of the cup matches in Europe. Um, and then at the end of the year, Spurs will have an option to uh, sign him up for £12.8 million, which I think is €15 million. Euros. Um, or I believe that there's another... Technically, what would happen is if he played, I think it's 20 competitive games. I can't I'm entirely sure whether it's 20 competitive appearances in all competitions or 20 Premier League games. I'd imagine it's competitive appearances. Um, Spurs have to do the deal. It becomes an obligation rather than an option. Um, and quite frankly, if he's played 20 games, they've been impressed enough with him. It's very clever. And, you know, £12.8 million for a, a player who was mostly the first choice keeper for Atalanta last year as they finished, you know, was it third in the league and he played in the Champions League. He's a good keeper. Um, for that sort of money, that, that's a bit of a snip, especially if he becomes the successor to Hugo Lloris. You know, it could be a real bargain going forward. Um, very good work there from Paratici. Um, so, yeah, he's in. He's come in. Uh, Joe Hart, I'm told, has, has been informed um, that he's not in the Spirit of Santos' plans. So, 
kind of is down to him now whether he moves on and, and gets some more game time elsewhere. Otherwise, he's third choice and very likely unlikely to play at all this season. Um, it's, it's a tough one. You know, I don't think he did that badly, Joe Hart, at all. I think he, from everything I heard, he was a good presence in the dressing room, you know, a real kind of a winner and um, rubbed off on a lot of the players as well, that kind of attitude. But if he's not part of the plans, he's not part of the plans. And obviously you've got Alfie Whiteman, who I said is really is coming along. He did very well at the weekend. And, and for him, it's kind of now a bit of a crunch time of either stepping up to become the, the, the third choice or getting a loan move. We've got Brandon Austins, who's at Orlando City in the MLS. He's playing there and he'll be back towards the end of the year when that season ends. England under-21 international. So... Yeah, I think, you know, I don't know what Joe Hart's on. I've got a feeling it's not too much, maybe twenty five, thirty thousand a week, something like that. I don't, I don't want to say for exact because I don't know what, what he's earning, but I, I remember at the time he signed being led to believe it was somewhere in that region. Um, obviously, getting that off the wages would be good for Tottenham and for him, you know, he probably just wants to play a bit of football, I'd imagine. Um, other departures, um, a sad one, Toby Alderweireld, you know, Obviously, I think I said over the last video or ones before that he made it clear that he wanted to leave Tottenham. Um, I think we're probably all slightly surprised at what looks like his destination. Uh, he's heading off to Qatar, uh, where he's uh, been holding discussions with, I want to get the name right, Al Dahail, I think is how you pronounce it. Anyone from Qatar can tell me whether that's actually said right, which is probably unlikely. Um, it's a very good deal for Tottenham. And him, really. I mean, for Tottenham, I think we're talking in the region of about £10 million or more, pounds, um, which for a, what's he, 32-year-old who wanted to leave, two years left in his contract, one of the biggest earners at the club, obviously only just signed that new deal, didn't he, when Mourinho came in a couple of months later. So to be able to facilitate his wishes to move on and get a decent fee and get a big earner off the books... You know, I think he was set to have his medical over there. He flew out there yesterday, I think it was. Um, and he was, um, yeah, I was led to believe he was going to do his medical there and, and finalise all his terms and everything. Um, I know some people have said, huh? but he wanted to go back to uh, Belgium or the Netherlands. What I would say, and I think I said this in a previous video, it's very difficult for that move to happen with his wages as they are. So perhaps from a personal personal perspective, for him, this gives him a couple of years to earn very good money still, um, just to kind of, you know, make sure he's financially ready to then step down financially when he goes back to whether it is the Netherlands or whether it's going back home to Belgium and or Antwerp, you know. Um, it kind of works on that level. Uh, so I do get that. Um, and also, you know, Roberto Martinez, the Belgian manager, has shown that he kind of doesn't. He's not as fussed about where players are playing. They're still getting in. You know, if the league isn't considered, and in, um, I don't know why I air quoted that. It doesn't make any sense. On paper, is seen as an inferior league to others. He hasn't kind of held that against players. They've still been internationals for him. Um, and for Alderweireld, you'd imagine the same. But you know, on a personal note, it'd be sad to see him go. I think with he and to uh, him and Jan Vertonghen together. Probably one of the best defensive partnerships I've ever witnessed in my lifetime. You know, certainly as in terms of Spurs, absolutely incredible balance, knew each other's games inside out. And Alderweireld at his peak was one of the best defenders in Europe. Um, I would say that his serious hamstring injury he suffered, you remember, right early on against Real Madrid in the first half of that Champions League game at, at the Wembley. I wouldn't say he maybe ever quite was consistently at the peak he was before that, which, you know, obviously can be expected as, as you're getting kind of a little bit older and you get an injury like that. But what I would say is we still saw enough that he was a very good player, even as recently as the Carabao Cup final. I thought he was phenomenal in that. Um, I really liked Toby Alderweireld. I think maybe he was getting to the stage where he could see that it was starting to get a bit tougher in the Premier League. I think Yang Vertonghen probably reached that point as well. And I certainly know Moussa Dembele got there. I don't know why there was a Belgian theme to that. But, um, yeah, it'd be... Uh, I still think he's probably got enough in him to keep playing in a... I don't want to be, you know... I don't want to go against Qatar and the league and all that. I do feel he's in a, maybe in a major league. He still could play 
um, you know, in, in Italy or somewhere like that. But it's always been a bit strange with Alderweireld. I've said this in the past that even when he was available for 25 million, when he had that clause in his contract when Spurs took an option, no one bid 25 million. I always found that very strange. For some reason, it just doesn't seem to attract um, clubs, and I don't know why. Because I think he's a superb player. But yeah. It looks like, as long as that all goes well with the medical and everything, and he's happy with the terms, it looks like that's where Toby Adderall will head, barring any late changes, which do happen with Tottenham Hotspur. Um, so, yeah, sad to see him go. But, you know, you'll have him have gone. Uh, Juan Foyth's gone, obviously. Villarreal took up the option to sign him. Cameron Carter-Vickers is expected to move on. That's three centre-backs heading out the door, defenders, um, bringing in, you know, potentially... Upwards of 30 million, 35 million for the three of them. We'll see. Um, which is, is something that Tottenham struggled to do. So, so getting players out the door and getting value for them, um, you know, is good. And then I, I know st- they'd be open to offers for Davinson Sanchez and Eric Dyer as well. They are properly looking to revamp the, the defence, you know. So uh, whether they come in or not, I know certainly no Davinson Sanchez has a fair bit of interest in him. Sevilla looking at him very closely as well. So you know you could see uh, you could see some a uh, real changes certainly in the centre back um, area because obviously um, Christian Romero, which you know I was very clear on last what were we a week ago now that. I know a lot of people report, reporting that Gallini was everyone. Uh, Spurs were talking to uh, Atalanta about Gallini, and obviously I said last week, lads, it's not just Gallini; it's Romero as well. You know, Spurs are very much in advance talks for both of them. Um, and oh, I don't want to jinx anything, but certainly there is a growing confidence within Tottenham that they could get this deal done for Romero. He. You know, the more and more I've looked into him and, and looked at his uh, footage of him, and you know, I'm not talking just YouTube compilations. I'm talking about because we we use things like Y Scout and stuff like that. It's having a slightly bigger view at what he does and, and longer ex, uh, clips of, of of him in action. And from everything that I've heard from people that watch him regularly, he honestly could be one of the biggest signings Tottenham have made in a long time. You know, he really could be. A real rock to build that defence around. Um, it's while I want to also slightly caveat things. He, it's going to be a it's a complicated deal to do. Tottenham, as as you know, I've said previously, they they like to structure deals. They like to do things in certain ways. Um, so it's you know I'm not going to say it's absolutely a hundred percent cast iron. This is going to happen because it's Tottenham Hotspur, and you just if anything, the managerial search has proved you just cannot do that. So. Um, but what I would say, there's a positivity. There's a hope that this is going to happen. The player, I'm told, is, is keen to join as well. Um, you know, I was always warned that there was a, a chance that, you know, if, if a Barcelona, say, came in, that he would kind of be like, oh, hello. But I think maybe the, the tough times that clubs like that are facing as well um, maybe make, gives Spurs a little bit more of a clearer path towards him. You know, I'm told we're looking at, Spurs have to pay roughly about thirty-eight and a half million pounds, which is about forty-five million euros. You've probably um, worked that out if you're cleverer than me. I did have to look it up and use a, a currency converter. Um, but yeah, that's still. I'm trying to work out roughly what they paid for Davinson and Sanchez. Uh, maybe slightly less. I'm trying to think about the extras. There may well be extras including this one as well, but. From what I understand, Daniel Levy has given the green light to this deal, you know, to try and make it happen. Um, it's it's an interesting one because it really does show how much Paratici has essentially come in. And if he wasn't listening before Levy, uh, which obviously I'm not going to say he wasn't, but certainly Paratici has come in and gone, man, that defence needs a proper shake-up. Uh, he is a player who is superb. He's just won the Copa America. Serie A Defender of the Year. You know, that is <laughs> Serie A. If you're Defender of the Year in Serie A, you've done something very well because that is a league with a lot of good defenders and defensive play at times. So, you know, he's very much been convinced, you know, this is the guy. Get him in. Fix fix this big old kind of error that Spurs really should have fixed last summer. 
Um, and I think there's probably an element as well of Spurs looking at the likes of Arsenal and seeing that Arsenal are going out there and spending um, and seeing other clubs, you know, because this is the issue with with um, with COVID as well. Is, is This is a real buyer's market because I think a lot of clubs are struggling hugely. And the kind of the thing that Tottenham did, which was, you know, I was saying previously, and it was absolutely right then, was that they really were struggling financially. They had a lot. £200 million lost revenue. That's not something you just go, yeah. you know, they can't do that. So, yes, I know people were saying, Joe Lewis. But Joe Lewis has not put money in over 20 years. He's not. So unless there's a miracle occurs, that's, you know, unlikely to happen. Um, but what I would say is what they did, which was very clever, and again, not to go over the old ground too much, but if you weren't aware... They had this short-term uh, Bank of England loan, uh, the COVID, I can't remember what it was called, something like the COVID Relief Facility, something like that. I can't remember what it was, fund. Um, and they, essentially that helped them run for the year and a half or so without the revenue. But then what they did was they got Bank of America refinancing thing, uh, which was through, I think it was private equity. I can't remember the exact expression. But essentially that took all of that lost or all that money they needed from the Bank of England loan, they were able to pay it off and then spread it across a much, much, much longer term loan with a very good deal. So that's where Spurs just had that little bit more money now to work with. They still need to sell. They still need to bring in a lot more. Uh, but it's just given them a little bit more to play with. So maybe they're slightly more back to... I may suppose you look at the summer of 2019, you know, when they were able to bring in... Ondombele and uh, Lo Celso and Sessignon and Jack Clark. Um, it wasn't meant to, that sounded really disparaging, Jack Clark. It wasn't meant to be like that. It was more that he was obviously a much lower fee than those other ones. Um, but yeah, obviously with the amount that Paratici is trying to get out the door as well, which we're going to keep, we're going to come to in a little bit. That's you know that's uh, it could end up that they could have a proper. I want to use the word spree because spree kind of sounds like you're throwing all your money at it. But they could uh, an overhaul is probably the best word. Is using funds that come in on top of having that little bit more money to play with. And like we say, these players come off the wage bill as well. Um, and Atalanta will do very well out of it. Atalanta did, I think, the option to sign him permanently from Juventus is oh, I've got it written down so I don't get it wrong. That was it. It's 16 million euros, which is 13.8 million. Um, so they will do that, and I think I said this before, that deal was done with a certain Fabio Paratici, <laughs> which is all very clever when you think about it. Clever or a bit naughty. Oh, God, that sounded awful. That's going to be one of those. I've noticed that someone's done this No Context Gold Twitter account, um, and I'm now very wary because um, they've started following some of my friends or fellow journalists and, and now very wary when I say daft things like that that it's going to end up on there. Um where was I? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, Romero, yeah, Atalanta are going to do that deal. Bring him in for 13.8 million, then sell him for 38.5 million, roughly. So, you're looking at a 20 million pound profit on a player, and then they can, you know, do a similarly clever deal with someone else. Uh, and everyone kind of wins, really, out of that. Um, but, yeah, let's get it over, over the line first, get it done. But, like I say, there's a bit of positivity about it. Um, and for Daniel Levy to give it the green light, that that's massive in itself. Um, so hopefully Paratici works his magic because, do you know what? If they bring in Christian Romero, I'll get slightly excited about this season to come because I think that would be a massive... You know, like I always felt Hoybier was a big kind of brick in the wall, a big foundation thing to, to prop it up. Nice mixed metaphor there. Um, I think Romero in that back line would be a real huge, huge kind of plus um, to build uh, from. But yeah, let's see what happens. It may be that I get to the end of this video and there's even better news out there already or or as Tony Hawks, but it could be absolutely completely opposite news. But uh, what will be interesting for me next is that Spurs, I was always told, had the intention of trying to, if possible, get two new centre-backs. So... It will depend now on whether if Davinson Sanchez goes. Um, I think he's probably the one you'd imagine out of him and Eric Dyer may be likely to move on. Uh, purely because I think there's maybe slightly more of a market for Davinson Sanchez because he was at the Copa America, played decently, finished third place. He was kind of on the... 
on the international map, as it were, in the shop window and, you know, severe interest. And I think there's a couple of others around Europe are as well. Um, and yeah, so if he were to move out the door, then Spurs start looking at every, other players on their list. I think Romero very much was the one that Paratici really, really liked. Um, obviously brought him to Juventus in the first place from, I think it was Genoa. Uh, but then you start to look at other players. Like, obviously, we know Jules Kunde was a player at Sevilla they really liked. Kunde is an interesting one. He's, you know, more a higher value than um, Romero. Uh, but obviously, with a severe interest in Sanchez, it slightly balances that up. I was told that his first choice was Real Madrid. Again, whether he's a player Real Madrid do end up going for, you know, if they lose Varane, it seems to be, the noises seem to be that they might not, um, and that he would, you know, would be interested in Tottenham if that wasn't an avenue for him. Um, my goodness, you know, wow. A romero Kunde partnership would be incredible, but I just wonder whether that's too much money as a whole to do right now in the window. I don't know whether that would be something that they would have to move on Sanchez and maybe another or so. We'll see because there are other deals also going on. I mean, but certain centre-back, you know, I must, I can't stress this enough if, if I haven't said this enough before. Fabio Paratici's method, sorry for those who have already heard this a million times. He looks at 10 different players, talks, has actually negotiates for ten up to 10 different players for each position he's looking for in his team which is a uh, this crazy spider web of transfer dealings. And that's not even including the names out there that are completely wrong, which Spurs aren't looking at. Um, so, you know, you look at it and the other players, I know they've got an interest in Lacroix, uh, um, Wolfsburg, uh, Milenkovic at Fiorentina, Skriniar, we know it, Inter is obviously someone the club have looked at. Uh, they certainly were looking at Joachim Anderson, but looks like, um, while they've kind of gone off for, for Romero, he's maybe slipped down the list slightly and looks like Crystal Palace are going to get him. Um, it's tough. I liked Anderson. I thought every time I saw him, I saw him live a few times um, and I thought he looked very good. For me, from everything I hear, I mean, Romero is, is a bit of a step up uh, without being disrespectful in any way, but He's obviously younger and he's a Copa America winner. He's you know, Serie A Defender of the Year. We're talking about a very, very, very good player. And I can understand why Spurs have prioritised him out of the, the, the list, really, that they're looking at. Um, and, yeah, so if Anderson goes to, to Palace, that'll be a good chance for him to kind of essentially show what he can do, I guess, uh, properly in, in the Premier League again after Fulham. Um, oh, I saw another name linked today. Was It, it was the chap at... Uh, what was his name? I want to get it right. Oh, I think I might have it written down here. Oh, it's Marseille chap, Duje Kaletakar. Kaletakar. Um, I saw him link, but I'm, I understand he's not someone that Spurs are currently looking at. Um, but yeah, there will be. There'll probably be more names that come out as well. Um, and and that's you know, uh, that's the way it is. It's the Paratici way. It's going to be. A, very frustrating for me, but it's fine. It's fine. It's uh, I just want something to get someone. And if it's if it's Paratici's method at the end of the day of getting the best player um, that he wants, crack on because my my happiness and comfort in reporting is not as important as Tottenham doing the best deals out there. That'd be fantastic. Uh, where else are we looking at defence? Serge Aurier, very much uh, intent on leaving the club, has, has made that very clear to them. I think his agent's working on stuff. Tottenham, as I understand it, um, hasn't. there isn't a bid in for him right now, but it's being, I think his agent is very much trying to sort a move for him. Um, just hopefully it comes sooner in the window. You know, it can't, if it comes later in the window, it's just a bit of a mess for everyone involved. Um, who else we got? Tommy Asu. That's an interesting one, what's happening with that, because obviously. He's away at the Olympics with Japan. However, he also has a bit of an ankle injury, which has kept him out of their first two games. I think they were playing today against Mexico, and he didn't feature in that either. Um, so that might be one of those where Spurs yeah, just have a little look and see what's happening first, see what's happening with the ankle. Um, uh, you know, the Olympics makes it all slightly more difficult to do the deals. There's another young player at the Olympics we're going to talk about in a moment. But, uh, yeah, Tomiyasu... Let's see. He's not going to be the most expensive player in the world. And like, like I said, we were talking about, you know, up to 20 million, maybe maybe slightly below that. Um, you know, Bologna have, a, 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 
the president's admitted yes, Tottenham have you know held talks over him. I think he may have even said they made a bid. Um, so let's see on that one exactly where that goes. I think, like I say, we'll see. I th- this week's going to be a busy one. It really is. Um, it's probably not going to be too much happening at left back. I'd imagine. Midfield, you no know, central midfield roles. Uh, I understand the club are open to offers for either Moose Soko or Harry Winks. Harry Winks is an interesting one. Up to this point, he's certainly, I'm led to believe, has signalled his intent to stay at the club. He'd like to stay and fight for his place under the spirit of Santo. However, I do wonder, you know, me talking about Spurs needing money, I think he's one of those players where especially as a homegrown and, you know, Winks only needs to have a start having a good season again. He's back in the England squad. He's one that I think they can get a bit of value for, a bit of money. And, you know, there's talk that both Villa and Everton have got an interest in him. Um, I think ultimately it'll be down to Harry Winks. You know, if, if he's told, look, you know, we've got Hoibier who's going to always start. Skip's coming back and looking like phenomenal talent. Um, it may be that you're not going to get again. You're going to have a season where you may not get the game time you want. Whereas if you go to Villa or Everton or another club, you may find yourself a week in, week out player. And, you know, ahead of the World Cup, which obviously comes a little bit sooner, not being a summer one, it may be, it may be something that benefits you more than anything. Um, so yeah, keep an eye, keep an eye on the wink situation. Be interested to see which way that goes. Uh, but certainly that, that would put money in the coffers for Tottenham. And, and whether then, if you lose to Soko and Winks, whether they have to look at a central midfielder to come in. You know, it'd be interesting. Obviously, we know he's not really a, technically a central midfielder because he kind of plays all over the place, but obviously we know they've had a long-term interest in Marcel Sabitzer, so I have to see what comes of that. Um, it's obviously, contract situation makes him very attractive, but it makes him very attractive for a lot of clubs. Um, but yeah, so see what happens in central midfield. And... Another player, I uh, said I was going to talk about someone else at the Olympics, it's Brian Gill. Um, <laughs> so I made it sound, Brian Gill, from down the road. I'm sure that is not how his name is pronounced. It's probably like Hill or Gilles or something. And I'm sure if anyone could tell me, that would be great. Although every time I say that, I must stress, every time I say someone tell me how it is, I get about four different versions in the comments of everyone telling me different ways to pronounce it. Um, but yeah, he's 20-year-old. 20, 20 one of the hottest prospects in Spanish football right now, young player. He's a severe player, but he went to Ibar last season in a team that was really struggling and eventually went down. He still stood out. And I think I saw somewhere maybe he was one of the top chance creators in the league, and that was for a team that was right down the bottom. So very talented players. And what I kind of like about this deal is that it kind of came a bit out of nowhere, which you might think, what? Why is a reporter like that? Well, while my reporter head, of course, wants to know about every single deal happening, when there is one that's suddenly like, boom, I quite like that from a club perspective, you know, because I think ultimately all clubs would love to work like that. It's it's the best way to work. And, you know, especially when it's a very young town to play like that, to suddenly come out of it, no media outlets were, you know, reporting it until it's, you know, we understand it's uh, quite an advanced stage now, or very advanced um yeah i like that i like that it sounds a bit weird because it kind of goes against everything that I, my profession would believe in but you, you, hopefully you know what i mean I, I like the fact that you can still do deals under the radar in, in today's world which is so obviously saturated media wise but yeah uh he's at the olympics right now he's playing um with spain he's, i think he came on as a sub in both their first games um I don't think there's any issue with him doing, say, a medical out there or, or certainly a big old chunk of the medical out there. But obviously, he then wouldn't be able to join Spurs fully until he comes back from the, the Olympics, which is likely to be, I think it's early next month if football finishes. Um, I can't remember exactly, but it would be a while. And then he'd have to isolate. Um, and the other thing I'd say about him is that he's he's very young. He's quite slight. Um, I think the Premier League would be quite a wow kind of bang physically for him he'd have to very much adapt and I'd hope that you know people wouldn't expect too much from him straight away he, he would very much have to adapt and grow and, and and put on a bit of bulk I'd imagine as well to handle it um but he's very talented he's a dribbler he's creative he can play I think he mostly plays he plays on the left mostly but he's versatile and I looked up where he was playing mostly for Ibar last season and he kind of 
sometimes was behind the striker, he was sometimes on the right, but I think primarily was on the left. Um, but yeah, he's a talented, talented young man. Um, and I, I think that one we'll see happen sooner rather than later. The only sad thing for me, and I know this isn't going to be shared by everyone, but Eric Lamella heading off in the opposite direction. Lamella, he loves Tottenham. He's very settled, very much his family are very settled. You know, he's got two young ones as well. Um, and I'm told he, he needed a little bit of convincing uh, to head to Sevilla, but they, he was convinced in the end. And for him, as I said before, I don't think he's in a position now where he's going to be a regular starter for Tottenham. Um, and I think he could be at Sevilla. I think he really could. And I like him a lot. I'm not going to go into it too much because Lamella haters get very upset. He's rubbish. He never plays. But I just always think he adds something to the team when he does play. I do. I think when he comes off the bench, I think he just adds something to Tottenham's game. That risk-taking, that aggression. And I like it. So I'm going to go dumb and dumb. I like it a lot. Uh, I do like him a lot. He's good. He, he, he's he's a good guy. I've obviously, again, interviewed him a few times, and he's he's just frustrated more so than anyone else with the injury problems he had. But he's. Um, I hope this gives him a really good kind of spark to his career because, you know, he's had some tough times, and he's a very good player. He really is, and I think it would suit him down to the ground. To be honest, at Sevilla, I'm sure Sergio Reguilon would have told him loads about it as well, having played there on loan. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I think that will get wrapped up quite quickly. It's, I think it's taken a little while purely because, or since we found out about it, because the swap element makes it slightly more complicated. And obviously there's the Olympic side to it as well. But I think that will get done sooner rather than later. And that's that's a talented attacker who, when you look at it, with Lamella going, that still means you have Gil, Son, Bergvine, uh, Lucas, Halley technically can play on the left as well as through the middle. Um you know, you, you've got a lot of talent there as well. And a lot of players who are very versatile, you know, Son and Gill and, and Bergwijn and Lucas can all kind of swap sides as well. And that's huge. All play behind the striker. For Nuno Spurs Santo, options. I used that word the other day, options. It's all about options. And, and it really is for him. Um, one link I saw was Mikael, um, I'm pronounce it right, Mikael Damsgaard, who's a Sampdorian Denmark midfielder. I'm told that there's not a player they're currently looking to make a bid for. I'd imagine maybe with Gil coming in, it's a similar kind of versatile player who can play across that attacking midfield areas. Um, but yeah, I'm told that that's not a goer right now. A uh, very talented player though, don't get me wrong, and, and it could change in the future, but at this moment, I'm told that that's not one. Um, I think that's kind of it at the moment. I'm sure as this window goes on, we'll start to talk more about who they're looking for as the, the striker to come in with Harry Kane to replace. Obviously, Carlos Vinicius has gone back. Um, and we must also forget that Gareth Bale, who obviously won't be playing for Tottenham next season, his more than £200,000 a week wages are also off of the, the wage bill as well. So that, that opens stuff up for Tottenham as well. So yeah, transfers, we will talk more. There is more to come. I think they want to get these deals kind of tied up. And I think this week is going to be a chaotic and hopefully exciting week as well. You know, we've already had one deal and I think we'll have a few more to come in the, in the days to come. And fingers crossed, Romero, because I think that would be superb. And then I think you'll see, if you see movement in the other direction, very quickly others will also follow. Because those deals will be at an advanced stage where then you just have to pull the trigger, as it were, when the money rolls in. Um, other little bits of housekeeping um, found out the other day that Spurs are looking to bring in a new head of emerging talent which in layman's terms is head of academy recruitment um, and it's Chris Perkins who does is the head of academy recruitment at Everton right now he did a really good job at Derby um, they he was credited with they went through uh, got to a stage where they had almost 50% of their first team were academy graduates and he was very much credited over five and five and a bit years of working at Derby of having kind of brought all of those players through really or into the club. Um, was only at Everton for like a year, a bit more than a year, and Spurs have already looked to snap him up. So I understand he's on gardening leave with Everton and he will make the move to Spurs probably after the summer. Um, but that's, you know, it's another another building block and it's someone that can help them kind of get try to get the best players in the, the London area and beyond um, into the academy. So, yeah, so let's see, that's him coming in. Um, 
Preseason players returning. Who have we got next? I think the Welsh boys are back or expected back tomorrow. Hugo Lawrence and Moose's Ahsoka, I'd imagine, are also this week because they went out of the Euros roughly the same time. Spurs policy is a minimum of three weeks. At least they want the players to take off and rest after a tournament. But potentially it's kind of roughly about a month after. So, yeah, Roden Davies, yeah, it's almost exactly a month they'll be coming back. Um, then you've got Harry Kane and Pierre-Emile Hoybier. I'd imagine if you're looking about a month after the semi-final and the final, you're getting very close to the first game. Um, I mean, certainly players can come back early if they want. Personally, I just wonder whether we're going to see them in that first game. I think there was even a report yesterday that said Kane's unlikely to. But I think it'll be the same for Man City. You know, they'll have players like Raheem Sterling and uh, John Stones and players like Phil Foden. I think he was injured, so he didn't play, did he? But I think you'll certainly see some players. And we saw it, I think, was it the World Cup year? Where the first game, a few clubs were easing those players who'd been out a bit later back. Because also... You know, Spirit Santo is wanting a lot more fitness from his players. So the likes of Harry Kane is going to have to come back and really work on his fitness. Um, it might be just too risky to throw him in a huge match like that. Obviously, Spurs need Harry Kane. Of course they do. But maybe the risk outweighs that one game. Um, so we'll see what happens. I'm sure a lot more will be made out of it. And it will be made to look like Harry Kane snubs Spurs, downs tools. But I think it will be more about just the fact of not really being ready, having only just returned in a few days before the match um, to pre-season. Um, obviously, it'll be slightly good thing, a slightly better level of fitness than maybe others because obviously he's playing in a tournament, but it still has to be treated so carefully. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it. Obviously, we've got the MK Dons friendly coming up on Wednesday night, which I'll be going to as well. So I'll be able to give you lots of stuff from that and hopefully seeing Fabio Paratici on his phone a lot as well. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we'll see. We're getting there. I'm really enjoying having matches. I think we've got open training next weekend as well, which I'm trying to sort myself getting into as well to watch because that'll be fascinating to see a little bit of an extended training session and obviously slight, slightly different to what you'd see at Hotspur Way, but certainly you'll get a good old aspect of the players and you'll have more of them joining in as well next weekend. Uh, so there you go. So like I say, with the way things are happening right now, you might have got to the end of this and I might be saying stuff you think, well, that's already happened. And if it has, brilliant. Or it might have gone the other way and that'd be rubbish. So there you go. Right, I'm going to head off. Um, yeah, I'm just telling you, there's nothing else other bits of housekeeping. I think I've covered everything I possibly can. I'm sure you're shouting at me going, no, you didn't talk about blah, blah. But if I didn't, I shall talk about them next time. Uh, so yeah, as always, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves and I shall catch you later. Goodbye.